Someone gave, someone donated, someone left a legacy. Generations of generous someones have helped shape Rhode Island into this amazing place we call home. How do you thank them? By leaving your own legacy. We can help. Welcome to another edition of In Another Opinion, a public information program focused on the communities of color. I am your host, Peter Wells. We have watched and listened to the President of the United States as he has arguably violated the rule of law. Legally issued subpoenas have been ignored by this President and his staff. So are they above the law? My guest today is our current State Attorney General, Peter F. Nerona, who was Rhode Island's U.S. Attorney from 2009 to 2017. Welcome, Peter. Peter, good to see you. Thanks Likewise. for having me on. Oh, my pleasure. And boy, have I got questions for you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm ready, I think. <laughs> Based on my intro, um, obviously, one of the things I wanted to talk to you a bit about is, is this whole concept of rule of law and, uh -huh. and where uh, the president stands, and then we can get into some of the weeds. But, sure. you know, he uh, apparently doesn't really believe in the rule of law, even though he took an oath to, to enforce it. Yeah, look, these are these are difficult and complicated times for the country. I mean, I, you know, to, to put your your statement or, or question in context, it's really in the context of what's going on in the impeachment inquiry that that the House is doing right now. Yes. And the question is, you know, when the House issues subpoenas, whether it be for testimony or for documents, what's the duty uh, of any citizen to comply, including the administration, but sure. also people who aren't in the administration? Um, and then if they don't comply, what are the uh, legal remedies? And the reality is, is that there are remedies, but they all have issues. Um, and I imagine we'll talk about some of them, yes. but, but none, of them, none of them provide a clean uh, means of enforcing compliance. See, that's, that's unfortunate. I know if you, if you Google subpoenas and you get a couple of definitions, uh -huh. and I noted that one of them suggested that talked about the queen, and the queen could not be subpoenaed. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm assuming that uh, President Trump has taken a page out of that book uh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> to feel as though he's above the law in that regard. Yeah, well, as frightening as that, you know, as frightening as that sounds, you know, let, me, let me try to sort of some talk about sort of the enforcement powers of Congress. Congress has three um, means of enforcing its subpoenas. Uh, one uh, is called the inherent uh, contempt authority, because contempt is the word that's used. Yes. If you don't, if you don't respond to, uh, to a subpoena, you can be held in contempt, either by a court um, or otherwise. So let's, let's talk a little bit about what those three things are. One is the inherent power of the Congress. It, it stems from the Congress's Article I power to legislate. They have the right uh, under the Constitution to do oversight, as decided by the Supreme Court. So there is a practice, um, it, it is very dated now, where if you don't comply with a congressional subpoena, the sergeant at arms of the Congress, House or Senate, could detain the person, bring you before the Senate or House, you could be tried and detained by the House or Senate until you either comply or in some instances be punished. That process hasn't been used since 1935. It was used in the early days of the Republic, but you can imagine having a, a trial of somebody before the House or Senate is unwieldy, uh, it's messy. Uh, if you detain someone, where do you detain them? Mm -hmm. Within the Capitol somewhere? Mm -hmm. um, so that's, a, that's a, one of the three um, uh, constitutionally recognized contempt authorities of the Congress or remedies of the Congress that just hasn't been used in a very long time and, and probably can't practically be used today. The other, the other means of enforcing a congressional subpoena when someone doesn't comply mm -hmm. is to refer the matter to the United States Attorney for criminal contempt proceedings. And that's happened in the past. It happened with Attorney General Holder mm -hmm. uh, in the Obama administration True. in the wake of Fast and Furious. Yikes. That was the yeah. ATF gun walking right. investigation that the Congress was doing. Uh, Attorney General Holder uh, withheld documents, uh, testified, but withheld documents. Um, the House found him to be in contempt, referred it for prosecution on criminal contempt to the United States Attorney for the District of Washington. A friend of mine, Ron Machen, was the U.S. Attorney at the time in D.C. Ron decided not to go forward. Um, he didn't think it was, uh, he, he believes that he has discretion. And there's some dispute about that, whether the U.S. Attorney has to go forward or not. Ron believed that he had uh, discretion as U.S. Attorney. He did not proceed. Um, and, you know, you can see how in a situation like we have today and like then, mm -hmm. where there's a lot of contention between the executive and legislative branch, sure. for the Congress to rely on the U.S. Attorney, an appointee of the executive branch to prosecute its, 
its contempt um, its contempt authority is not likely to go anywhere. So that's number two. So mm. so far we're zero for two, right? So the third th uh, the third power that the Congress has is to go to the court. Uh, and ask the court for a court order requiring somebody to testify. And that's what's happened in the case of Don McGahn, the White House counsel. Yes. Uh, and the court, at least the district court, has ordered Don McGahn uh, to appear um, and testify. Now, he may be he, able to invoke some privilege, but he has to come in. Is he appealing that? He is appealing it. And the, and the problem is, and there's not a lot of case law on, on where, where it goes if he does have to show up. So, for example, let's assume he has to come at all. The president has argued that for his top staff, they don't even have to show up, right. let alone answer some questions and not others exerting executive privilege. Um, the district court has held that he has to show up in McGahn's case. Uh, the president or the administration is going to appeal that to um, the circuit court, circuit court of appeals. The question is, let's assume the circuit court of appeals requires Don McGahn or other, or other witnesses to testify. Sure. Then what's the scope of the executive privilege? that uh, the witness can assert. You know, the deliberative process within the administration, that is, is typically, that's a, that's a privilege that is recognized. How far does that privilege go? And there's not a lot of case law on it because, for two reasons. Number one, the contempt authority of the Congress only lasts for as long as that particular Congress is in session. So when you take a case to the courts, it takes so long to work its way through the courts right. that as a practical matter, by the time a decision is reached, there's a new Congress, and you this have to start all over again. This is why Pelosi and, and Schiff aren't waiting. Correct. So exactly right. So what what it becomes when someone doesn't um, when someone doesn't uh, respond to a subpoena, it the Congress is left in a situation where there is a practical as a practical matter, there isn't a lot they can do to enforce those subpoenas. And so I think what they're trying to do is let it play out in the court of public opinion. We're giving you an opportunity. We've given you a lawful subpoena. You're, you're uh, blowing it off, to mm -hmm. use the vernacular. What does that say about you? And, and I think that's why you're beginning to hear a narrative coming out of the Congress that the failure to appear, uh, the assertion of executive privilege where it's not warranted, is an obstruction of justice and is a grounds for impeachment in and of itself because the legal remedies are not very robust. Before I get to this next question I was going to ask you, but we have Bolton, mm -hmm. who's no longer a part of the administration, mm -hmm. but he was issued a subpoena, mm -hmm. and he's asked the court mm -hmm. to let him know if he has to go or not, mm -hmm. um, which ties me into the question, if I receive a subpoena, mm -hmm. do I get a chance to go to the court and say, I don't really want to go to, to respond to the subpoena? Well, you do. So, so we'll, we'll, let me just take the first part of, the, of that question sure. first, and then we'll get to sort of how it works you know, for the rest of us. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. okay. Yeah. So there is a distinction that the Supreme Court has drawn, and our, our courts have drawn between the president's uh, critical national security staff okay. and members of the administration generally. And again, a lot of this law is in flux. It hasn't firmly been decided by the Supreme Court. It's been decided by some courts in the D.C. Circuit and the mm -hmm. District of Columbia federal courts. But there is an argument that there are really three steps. First of all, does a member of the administration have to appear at all? Are you leave out whether you have to answer all the questions. Do you right. even have to show up? Right. And there is a distinction that's been drawn between members of the... Of the, um, the inner circle, so Correct, to speak. particularly in the context of national security. So there's, there's some dispute about that, whether you do have to show up at all. Mm -hmm. uh, the trend lines seem to be that you do, but, but it's a matter in dispute. And I think that's what Bolton's trying to get from the court. Do I have to even show up? Then if you have to show up, then the question is, to what extent can I assert this executive privilege? What is the scope of the privilege? Uh, and, and look, that's a, that is, and I deal with this myself as I try to work through issues in the AG's office. You know, my deputy attorney general and I may be talking about a sensitive issue. I may start in one place. We may discuss something and write, you know, in, by email. Yes. That's the way we communicate today, particularly when one's out of the office and one isn't or on the mm -hmm. weekends or whatever. And I get to a place eventually in my decision-making process that changes from where I started. Um, I think it's a good thing for, for us to be able to assert the privilege in that context because... I don't want to be. I don't want to hesitate on what I'm thinking about an issue initially and have that used against me later. My final decision should be should be what's important. But back to back to where we are with, with Bolton. Mm -hmm. So Bolton is really, I think, going to court to try to figure out or to get a decision that says, look, I do in fact have to appear. And if he does, then the then the issue will be how much can I talk about? How much am I allowed to talk about? And by the way, the privilege is not Bolton's; it's the administration's. Right. 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 It's, 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 right. The, the administration holds the privilege, not Bolton. Right, and so, he's no longer a member of the team. Right, but that doesn't matter because what he's being asked about 
is, is the what took place okay. on his watch. And again, the administration holds a privilege, not, not Bolton himself. Gotcha. So for the rest of us, here's how it works for the rest of us. So when you get a grand jury subpoena, or a court subpoena, but it typically comes up in the mm -hmm. context of the grand jury process, uh, you can do one of three things. You can not come at all, which is a, which is a problem. Mm -hmm. You can come and testify, or you can file a motion in court to what's called quash the subpoena, which means there's no legitimate basis for me being subpoenaed. Mm -hmm. Those are almost never granted, the, the rule of thumb. <laughs> the old phrase is a grand jury has a right to every man or every person's evidence. So absent very un unusual circumstances, those motions to quash are not, are not recognized. Obviously, you have a Fifth Amendment privilege not to testify, and in some instances, we won't call. We typically don't call people to testify before the grand jury if they're going to assert their Fifth Amendment privilege. But by and large, you have a duty to show up. And if you don't show up, or, or you file your motion to quash and it's not, grant, not granted, it's denied, mm -hmm. and then you don't show up, um, we can get a, a court order to have you uh, held. We can ask the court to hold the witness in contempt. That doesn't happen very often. But that is the, that is the typical remedy uh, for, the, you know, for the average everyday uh, Rhode Islander and citizens across the country. This is, this is a very different situation. Yeah, it is. Than what's it's, before the Congress. It's scary. Mm -hmm. It's scary. I mean, as I look at it, uh, you know, uh, spending so many years in government and knowing uh, I took an oath in, in the things that I needed to do and mm -hmm. needed to respond. I was with the Inspector General's staff mm -hmm. for a while uh, in Washington. So, I mean, it, it just doesn't set right. It just doesn't set right with me as to the level of, of disdain this administration is showing to the rule of law. Well, look, Congress has a legitimate oversight function, right? The, yes, they do. They do. I mean, it, it's enshrined in our Constitution. And unfortunately, only one house is doing it. Yeah, well, at the moment, yes, <laughs> yes. You know, it, it is, it's interesting how it shifts as, as administration shift. You know, the, we, we alluded to it, the Fast mm -hmm. and Furious um, investigation um, of uh, the Justice Department you know, was, you know, the House was controlled by the Republicans, um, had a real issue with the Obama administration, generally speaking. Yes. Fast and Furious kind of became the, the, the point uh, where, which, where which, it came together. And which they, was really a Bush policy that he inherited, if I recall correctly. Yeah, you know, look, you know, that was a, um, I was in the uh, Justice Department at the time. Um, that, was a, that was a difficult time for, uh, for the ATF and the Justice Department generally. And there was a lot of, um, mm -hmm. there were a lot of mistakes made, both in, operationally and then in, frankly, in, in disclosing. Mm -hmm. If you go back and, and you look at that, at that investigation, the Justice Department got it wrong in its initial disclosure, and there were some reper repercussions for people in the Justice Department within ATF as a result. But, but look, when, when we are in a politically divisive time, um, we have an administration and a, and, a, and a house, in this instance, that are diametrically opposed to one another in so many ways. Um, and the issues are as sensitive as um, issues that may change an election, mm -hmm. um, that go to the abuse of authority by the president. And I'm talking about the Ukraine matter now. Those are mm -hmm. serious allegations. And when you have a, a, a polarized government with allegations that are that serious, um, you're going to get this conflict, and I agree with you. It's unfortunate. Certainly, I think the witnesses should show up uh, because I don't too. think I, I don't agree. think that the law supports them not showing up at all. We saw with McGann. I suspect we'll see with Bolton. And then the fight comes over. What can they testify about? That's not unique, and it's not unusual. In the past, the government has, and that's why we don't have a lot of law on it. The Congress and the administration have come to an agreement. That yeah. is what typically happens. Oftentimes, behind closed doors. Sure. Um, so we'll, I, I don't see that happening here. No, he doesn't um, want to strike a deal. So we'll see how this plays out. And look, we're, it's going into an election year and the ultimate referendum on all this will be next November. Now, does this, the same aspects of law apply to documentation as it does to the individual? Yes. Yes. So it's whether it's for testimony or records, uh, the same standards and the same rules apply. Of course, this was the issue with Attorney General Holder in Fast and Furious. It was less about his testimony. He testified. Yeah. He asserted privilege, yes. um, the executive privilege, uh, the deliberative process, um, and how also it was interesting in that case because the question was whether that deliberative process of the executive privilege, the executive mm -hmm. privilege falls into a couple of things. One includes this deliberative process, 
you know, how the executive uh, how the executive branch reaches a decision. That's a deliberative process, sort of subset of the executive privilege. But it applies not only to formulating policy, but also how you're going to respond. This was the issue. The Congress wanted to know how the administration had discussed how they were going to respond to Congress. Mm -hmm. And so there was a big dispute about that. And, and the court uh, in Holder ultimately decided that that was also covered um, by the privilege. But there what the fight was about the documents. Uh, it was less in the emails. It was less about the actual testimony because Attorney General Holder testified. I have very, you know, I have very uh, vivid memories of the boss going up to the Hill. And, mm -hmm. you know, I was on his, uh, his advisory committee not advising him on, on that particular issue, but there, there were 16 U.S. attorneys from around the country that advised the AG on policy matters. Mm -hmm. I was on that committee for him. So I remember very, very vividly uh, being in Washington from time to time as that was happening. And, and the Attorney General went up there and he testified. And there was a dispute with Congress as to what he could testify about and what documents he would turn over. But he showed up. Um, and uh, it would be nice to see that out of this administration as well. It would. Well, let me ask you this. Is are the rules the same at the state level mm -hmm. as it is at the federal level? More or less. Yeah, more or less. I mean, I, you know, I've been in both systems for about right. an equal number of, of years. And, um, and yeah, they are basically the same. I mean, if you, are, if you are subpoenaed to appear before a grand jury, then you have to show up. If you don't want to show up, the answer is to go to court and ask for the court, state court or federal court, to quash that subpoena, to, to make a ruling that you don't have to show up. Again, right. that's sort of what McGahn is doing right. uh, in, 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 in the context of this impeachment inquiry. But then if you don't show up, if you don't show up, then we can, we can as prosecutors, go to court and ask the court to hold you, uh, the person, the witness who won't show up, in contempt. And that can really take two forms. One is called civil contempt and one is called criminal contempt. What right. civil contempt is... You either get fined for every day you don't comply, or you can be detained, incarcerated. Sure. And the phrase is you have the keys in your pocket because you can let yourself out at any time by either paying the fine sure. or showing up or and showing testifying. Sure. Criminal contempt is, is a little different. That's, that's when, and the court can do this on its own initiative or can be referred to the prosecutor's office to prosecute for criminal contempt. And there you can just be punished. Um, so in that instance, you don't hold the keys. You have now been sanctioned for for not appearing, and, and you can be held um, only as long uh, on the civil contempt side for as long as the grand jury is in session. So if you think back to Barry Bonds and the Balco scandal, where yes. Barry Bonds was using steroids, allegedly wouldn't com uh, comply with the grand jury subpoena, was ultimately, um, I don't think it was, actually, I don't think it was Bonds, I think it was his trainer, but whoever it was, um, was detained for only as long as the grand jury sat, but no longer than 18 months. So there's a there's only so much time that you can be detained. But the process is, is essentially the same uh, in both the state and federal system. It doesn't come up a ton. In my experience, in my personal experience, both on the line for 15 years, state and federal, and then running offices, state and federal, for you know about 10, mm -hmm. I don't remember it ever coming up in my practice. Well, I think most people are afraid of the idea of bumping heads with a court. Yeah, look, I mean, and look, and, and, if, and, and look. The, the reality is, is that if you feel like your testimony is going to incriminate you, you have a right against self-incrimination, and you can assert the Fifth Amendment. But you still have to show up. Well, to it, assert it. Yeah. Well, yes and no. I mean, it, you know, the policy in the Justice Department, and I've I've uh, I've adopted the same policy on the state side. Is if you inform the prosecutors that you're going to assert the Fifth Amendment, it is typically our practice not to pull you and put you into the grand jury. Typically not. Um, well, because you're not helpful. Well, right, and and look, we and, and I think there's a notion that we don't we don't want to put people who we know are going to assert the fifth, as expressed to us, in that position. That we respect that right enough that we're going to allow somebody to assert it. That said, there are exceptions to the policy, and I have had situations where I've had, um, I've had you know personally witnesses in the grand jury, mm -hmm. and that typically ap applies to targets of the grand jury, not so much the witnesses. I've had witnesses in the grand jury. Uh, where they've asserted the fifth, and you know, you'll ask a few questions. You know, where do you sure. live? They assert the fifth. You know, um, yeah. what's your name? They'll assert the fifth. They typically have to answer those questions. But then you'll ask three or four more questions. They'll assert the Fifth Amendment, and you'll ask them. You know, I would ask them, and my colleagues historically have done this. You know, do you intend to assert the Fifth Amendment privilege to every question I intend to ask you? And they say yes, and you typically let them walk out the door. But we don't tend to bring people in who are the targets of our investigation uh, to make them assert the fifth. We let them assert that in writing. Do you think that uh, the administration's desire not to uh, uh, participate or cooperate with this uh, impeachment inquiry um, as it relates to subpoenas and do for documentation and or for witnesses, um, 
There's an expression I've heard that uh, a good good attorney can indict a ham sandwich <laughs> <laughs> at, a grand, at a grand jury level. <laughs> so you, you think that may have a little something to do with it? Well, look, you know, um, I don't know. I, I think I think this is largely. Um, I think the reason why the administration is not cooperating is because the president. Uh, look, I think for some people, the institutions matter. Yeah. I think for this president, the institutions don't matter as much as his predecessors. Um, I think that's why Attorney General Holder went up to the Hill and testified on Fast and Furious. Sure. Uh, he knew Congressman Nissa um, had a hostility towards the department and to the Attorney General. He yeah. went anyway. And the administration. Yes, but he went anyway because he viewed the institutions as being important and that he was not above the institutions. So I, I, think, I think that's the lesson here. You know, the, you know, the ham sandwich, I always kind of chuckle at that because the fellow who made that, you know, there was a, there was a politician who famously made I'm that sure. statement after he was indicted. Well, you know, it means nothing. You know, you can indict a ham sandwich. He got ultimately convicted by a jury of his peers. So, so who knows what, you know, how, uh, how much meaning that phrase really has. But, but I think this is really about the institutions of our government, the norms of our government, yes. and how this president views them. And I, you know, there's no doubt, and this is a vast understatement, that this is an unusual president huh. looking at our norms in an unusual way, in a way that I think ultimately is detrimental to our country. Oh, no question. You know, it's our institutions. Our institutions hold back our worst instincts, right? Um, all of us have moments, I think, in our lives where, but for our institutions, but for the law, um, but for our respect for our peers, our families, we would do or say things that we shouldn't. Um, but it's that construct that keeps us as a civilized society from, mm -hmm. from not acting on our worst instincts, you know, from being rude to a family member to doing something much more serious. Sure. And when those institutions erode, um, that really worries me. Well, you know, you mentioned um, when we first started talking about the, the whole concept of executive privilege and um, uh, the inner workings of the staff, and that's who it really covers, mm -hmm. and the documentation related to them. Um, I wonder if there is, uh, and this is, of course, not a conspiracy theory, but I just wonder whether or not uh, the fact that the president has decided to have acting department heads mm -hmm. in so many locations, mm -hmm. including national security, mm -hmm. um, is that really a, a, a ploy to eliminate people who would have access mm -hmm. to information and therefore not be credible witnesses anyway. Yeah. Well, I know I, it's a stretch. Yeah, look, I, I think, Peter, I think I'm less concerned about that than I am about the Congress's inability to weigh in on people who are entrusted with doing the country's most important business. Yes. You know, I had to be confirmed by the United States Senate to be the United States Attorney. Right. Uh, and that wasn't just a rubber stamp. You know, I had to fill out a very long Senate questionnaire. Sure. Which said a lot about, you know, the cases I tried, my financial background, what mm -hmm. my wife did. Um, that's a good thing. That's a good thing for the Congress to have an independent set of eyes on who's handling one of these sensitive positions. And I was the U.S. Attorney for Rhode Island. I would argue, you know, an important role, but, but you know, look, it, it was the U.S. Attorney for the District of Rhode Island. You know, it, you know, it, I like to feel like we had an impact on our state, but still, I mean, in the, you know, in the, in the hierarchy of our government, yeah. not incredibly highly placed, I would say. So think about all the positions between the U.S. Attorney for the District of Rhode Island and the President. Yeah. Most of those positions require Senate confirmation. Yes. By naming and acting, you can end run that process a lot, uh, and that and that concerns me. I don't I don't think it's a good thing to have a, for example, just staying within the Justice Department, to have um, to have actings in so many positions that no one's really answerable in the first instance to the Congress. Right. And what kind of attitude does that set up towards the? In other words, if the institutions are being ignored, it's one thing to have an acting for the period of time it takes yeah. to get the permanent person in. But my permanent replacement as U.S. Attorney in Rhode Island didn't happen until this January. You know, it took almost two years. I don't, I don't think that's a good thing. I think, no. only, I think only somebody who has the, who is a Senate-confirmed, presidentially appointed Senate-confirmed uh, position can really move the ship in a way that people will follow. I think otherwise you're a caretaker. Mm -hmm. So even setting up aside some of the more nefarious aspects of that, I think your ability to lead is really diminished. I think that's a problem. I don't think you can be as effective. You know, no, I, I agree. 
Um, I wasn't um, Senate confirmed. I was congressionally approved here locally uh, when the secretary mm -hmm. appointed me as the regional director. Um, and I filled out most of those same forms <laughs> as well. <laughs> they take a over while. Over the years. Oh, yeah, especially when I was with the inspector general staff. Mm -hmm. But the, uh, uh, the, the fact of the matter, it, it gave me a sense, and I'm sure you as well, of commitment to the country mm -hmm. And again, to that constitution, which we, we all took an oath to uphold. Oh, sure. You know, I, I think I remember taking those oaths as yes. an assistant AG, as an assistant U.S. attorney, as U.S. attorney, and, and later as AG. And, you know, when I think back on my public service, and I talk about this a lot when I'm out, when I'm out sort of engaging the community, um, it's a really solemn thing. It is. Uh, and as a prosecutor, when you stand up and you say that you represent, you know, the United States, or the state of Rhode Island, or the people of the state of Rhode Island, the people of the United States, um, you, you're taking on a responsibility that it's not about winning. It's not no. about winning. You know, and, and one thing I try to talk to young prosecutors, I was a young prosecutor once, is that the job isn't about winning. It's about doing justice. It's, it's your, um, your duty is to a higher authority than the victim in a case even. You're seeking justice for victims, but victims don't drive what we do. And sometimes, sometimes that leads to some uncomfortable conversations with victims. But it's that higher duty I, that, that sort of always stayed in the back of my mind as a prosecutor and I think should inform members of government. Mm -hmm. And when you see an administration that departs from that solemn duty, as I think we've seen in this administration, yes. what kind of example does that set for everybody else? I mean, I, I look at my old colleagues in the Justice Department and, you know, they soldier on. Um, and, uh, but not everybody, not everybody can stick it out. I have a friend who was, visited us for Thanksgiving, was an assistant U.S. attorney in Washington for almost 30 years, stepped down a couple of years ago to do something else. Yeah. I mean, he was, he was a hair's breadth away from retirement, but he left before he could retire because he just wanted to do something that had meaning it felt like what he was doing in this administration didn't hold meaning anymore. Yeah. That's a remarkable thing. It is. It's terrible. Peter, listen, uh, as long as we have people like yourself, however, who still take that, that oath seriously and impart the rule of law the way it should be, um, I think the country has a chance to recover from this period. But um, it's, it's, a, it's a tough deal. We have to have you back on the show because we've run out of time. I'd love to come back. Great conversation, Great. Peter. Thank you. But we have run out of time, and I want to thank today's guest, Attorney General Peter F. Nerona, and you, the viewers, for tuning in to another edition of In Another Opinion. A special thanks to PBS for making this program possible. Give us your opinion on Facebook or Twitter at In Another Opinion. I'm your host, Peter Wells, and what's your opinion? Someone gave, someone donated, someone left a legacy. Generations of generous someones have helped shape Rhode Island into this amazing place we call home. How do you thank them? By leaving your own legacy. We can help.